Good afternoon and welcome back. Welcome back. Megan Scanlon is the Palaszczuk Government's Minister for Housing. With both of her parents growing up in government housing, she understands the power of social reform and how it can positively change people's lives. She, she knows the impacts of national housing pressures and uh, they're having on Queensland, which is why she's focused on rolling out a record spend on social and affordable homes as quickly as possible. Megan's driving a $5 billion investment for social and affordable housing, the single largest concentrated investment in Queensland's history to help deliver 13,500 homes. Beyond the Palaszczuk government's big housing build, Megan is also focused on looking at new and innovative ways to tackle housing issues head on and rolling out different types of housing and homelessness support. Prior to entering politics, she worked as a solicitor and was then elected to the seat of Gavin on the Gold Coast in 2017 and has served as Assistant Minister for Tour Tourism Industry Development, then Minister for the Environment and Great Barrier Reef and Minister for Science and Youth Affairs in 2020. It's very generous of, of Minister Scanlon to join us today as it's a sitting week in Queensland Parliament, so she's literally popped across the river during the lunch break, foregoing the cucumber sandwiches as she does need to get back before sitting resumes. So without further delay, please welcome Minister Megan Scanlon. Thank you very much. And I do need to be back because we've got a division in Parliament as soon as I get back. So I'll try and keep this brief. But can I just start by uh, thanking you very much for having me for this conference here today. And thank you all for coming to Queensland, which we think is the greatest state in the country. But of course, you will have your own views from your different states and territories. Um, but can I start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and pay my deepest respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, can I, and I can see Neil uh, sitting here before me, can I acknowledge the significant work we all do need to continue to do to close the gap, to make sure that we are providing appropriately sized homes for First Nations people across this country, but also that we are empowering and growing our uh, First Nations-led community organisation sector. Those are really important priorities of our government, but I know of governments right across the country. It is a privilege to welcome you all here to Queensland uh, and we, of course, uh, we're really pleased to be hosting this event in our state for what is a really significant issue impacting the entire nation. Uh, as has just been mentioned, I've fairly recently been sworn in as the Housing Minister. In fact, my office has done the numbers. I have been the Housing Minister for 146 days and depending on what day of the week you ask me, it feels like it's been longer or shorter than that. Uh, but each one of those days, it's been a great privilege because as has been mentioned, and this is a really personal role for me. Both of my parents grew up in government housing. Uh, they, I've seen the impact that had on our lives. Both of my parents went on to work in the public service and they both got, used to get incredibly frustrated at politicians not listening to people actually working on the ground. So one of the first things that I did when coming into this role was to travel across the length and breadth of Queensland and to listen to industry, to our specialist homelessness services, to community housing providers, to really identify where there are gaps and where there might be solutions from people working at the coalface. And unfortunately, what has been made clear is that there is not one single thing that is going to solve the housing challenges that we're experiencing. But I think that there are different ways that we can do things together. Uh, and I was really, really pleased today to announce in Parliament uh, that we are one step closer thanks to more funding from the federal government. I know that the federal government has obviously uh, uh, signalled a $2 billion investment right across the country, but Queensland announced today uh, that we will be providing, uh, we will be distributing our nearly $400 million of funding from the Commonwealth across Queensland to deliver an additional 600 homes. Uh, those 600 homes will be on top of our existing $5 billion commitment to build more social and affordable homes homes, which takes our overall target to 14,100 new homes. And to give you an idea, we've already delivered... Thank you. We've already delivered over 4,000, so there are just 
10,000 to go in a fairly short period of time. So of course we're looking at really innovative ways that we can get that scale quickly and Queensland has the unique experience of being the most decentralised state in the country which makes it incredibly difficult for us to scale up supply but we felt as though it was important that we distributed those homes evenly across the state based on need and so you will see uh, when you look at the detail there are homes being delivered in Cape York all the way to the Gold Coast and everywhere in between. Uh, and as I said, that will, that will add to our existing target. And we, of course, acknowledge that investment from the federal government. We think it's a really welcome step forward, but we know that we can't stop there. The housing sector is under unprecedented pressures right now. In Queensland, we have the highest level of net, net interstate migration uh, in the country. We're obviously all experiencing significant international migration as well. Uh, based on our numbers, we're expecting another 2.2 million people to call Queensland's southeast home by 2046. And why wouldn't you? I think that it's a beautiful place to live. And of course, we welcome all of those people moving to our great state. But we need to adjust a few things if we're going to be able to provide a home for all of those individuals. Uh, and that's why we're trying to lay the groundwork right now with the national government and uh, at making sure that we do things differently in terms of the, you know, the, the way in which we know people are changing the way that they're living. We also know that there are a lot of pressures right now, and I don't need to remind all of you about the consecutive RBA interest rate changes uh, that are putting a lot of pressure on households interstate migration. Uh, we also have chronic labour shortages and supply chain constraints. All of that has been an enormous pressure cooker on the housing system. Uh, and COVID has really reshaped the way that I think people are living and working. And you can see that in the data when you look at how many people are now living by themselves rather than in families units. And we took a decision as a government that we could keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result or we could change things based on the fact that our economy has changed. And so to do that, what the Premier has done is not only uh, given me this new portfolio, which is a standalone portfolio of housing, we've created a standalone department of housing with a singular focus on making sure that we can do all things housing under one roof. Uh, we have a new DG as well for housing, who I believe spoke to you all earlier today as well. And beyond that, that, that restructure, what that also provided was bringing the housing investment fund under our portfolio, but also we used to just deliver social housing. We've also now got within our remit affordable housing which means that we need to do a lot of work with my colleague in uh, the Deputy Premier uh, and his agency on how we make sure we get the right planning systems in place to unlock affordable housing across this state. Uh, and as I said, we're really proud of the Housing Investment Fund. Uh, we've already seen a number of projects get up off the ground where uh, the Housing Investment Fund works by working with institutional investors, with super funds, with community housing providers, developers, to really provide a long-term pipeline of funding and uh, confidence to the sector to try and deliver more homes over and above what the state government does beyond our public housing investment. Uh, and I think on the slides you should see some of those big projects that are already coming up off the ground, but I've had the opportunity to do some sod turns with Brisbane Housing Company. They've uh, been approved to deliver 1,200 homes through that particular scheme. Uh, we've also been working with other community housing providers to purchase ex-national rental affordability scheme homes to add them into our social housing and affordable housing mix. And there are about 70 additional projects that have been shortlisted and are going through that next pipeline. And my hope is that the Housing Investment Fund uh, will, will obviously build on the traditional forms of public housing investment, but it's a more comprehensive approach across the supply spectrum that integrates both social, affordable and market products to deliver the types of homes that we know that people are increasingly wanting. We're also working really closely, as I said, with the Deputy Premier's portfolio, who has, he's got the, he's the Minister for Planning, to streamline planning processes uh, and increasing integration between housing and planning. We've changed a number of rules to, uh, to try and make sure we can increase supply, so things that allow us to see more granny flats to be rented on the open market. We've also removed a number of planning barriers for the delivery of temporary emergency housing, empowering local and state governments to act swiftly without the need for development approvals. 
Uh, and today I'm really pleased to share with you that we've introduced new legislation into the parliament, the Housing Availability and Affordability Bill, which shows we once, we, once again that we aren't afraid to use state planning interventions to encourage housing supply. Uh, it gives you a bit of a uh, breakdown on, this, uh, on the PowerPoint, but really what it does is uh, is a significant change to remove existing barriers to housing and land supply to continue hopefully planning for the future growth of our state. Uh, the legislation will make a number of changes as has been outlined there, but really we think that these tools can be used in growth areas across Queensland. It focuses on uh, major developments that are prioritising infill, where we think that there's affordability opportunity and also working to make sure that we can uh, also support other greenfield sites uh, get up off the ground more quickly with some of that, those associated easements and other infrastructure that's needed. So it's fairly bureaucratic, but it's a really important bill that I think will be critical in working with the private industry. Now, when it comes to, obviously, the work that we're doing in the housing space, we acknowledge that we uh, need to plan and build, but we also need to look at how we address some of the current housing needs for Queenslanders who are doing it tough right now. Across Queensland, we fund around 90 organisations to support 194 specialist homelessness services. Uh, they deliver outreach services for people who are experiencing homelessness. And I was able to update the parliament this week that just in the last financial year, those funded services helped over 45,000 Queenslanders. And in partnership with our government, they've provided over 1.6 million nights of accommodation. That's over and above our social housing investment of the 75,000 people who are in sort of permanent homes. That's just the investment where we're working with those particular providers. And additionally, each night across Queensland, there are up to 2,400 2, temporary supported accommodation places for Queenslanders doing it tough, including 340 places for women and children experiencing domestic and family violence. We've also supported over 78 households experiencing rental stress uh, with things like rental grants and rental security subsidies and bond loans and uh, other forms of assistance to really help people maintain a roof over their head while we deliver our big build. Uh, and as we move towards a comprehensive Queensland housing plan, we will also be undertaking an independent and holistic review of Queensland's homelessness response to ensure that we have appropriate, coordinated and well-resourced and fit-for-purpose funding and support for those services that we know do really, really important work. But as I mentioned, we know that we need more help from all levels of government. And that's why we will continue to look uh, to the federal government and the Housing Australia Future Fund. We're really pleased to have the Housing Australia Future Fund pass through the parliament. We've been working with Q Shelter and other organisations to make sure our community housing sector has the capacity to go after the share that we think that we, uh, that we would like to get here. But it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the fact that uh, 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 we have had a substantial amount of years where we have had underinvestment and programs that have left the system that have made it more difficult for all of us to do our jobs. Uh, we, we didn't agree with the decision to discontinue the National Rental Affordability Scheme in the absence of any other suitable alternative for Queensland alone. That meant 10,000 affordable homes no longer in the system and we no longer have the National Partnerships Agreement for Remote Indigenous Housing, which was a really critical fund for us delivering important housing in particularly regional and remote communities. We also think that it was a missed opportunity during the pandemic for the federal government to invest in programs like Home Builder that didn't deliver any additional social homes. We in Queensland had a program called Works for Tradies that delivered more homes across the state. But we can't change the past. What we can do is acknowledge where we are and move forward. And I'm really pleased to see that we now finally have that bill passed through the Senate and we're able to now make sure that we unlock the potential in each of our states and jurisdictions to go after those 30,000 homes that will be funded, as well as that additional uh, social housing accelerator program funding 
But we know that that uh, is not a, that's not the end to the conversation with the federal government. We will have an opportunity at the end of the year and early next year to renegotiate our uh, our relative uh, national partnership agreements, and we're really looking forward to that engagement and the priority of housing. It gives me great faith that we have a prime minister in this country who grew up in government housing, who knows why investment in these areas is so incredibly important. And I suppose I'll just end on saying that uh, we acknowledge that we need a long-term plan, and I think that gives confidence to the sector, to our states and jurisdictions, uh, but it's something that I think should be core business for government. And we're committed to developing a long-term plan while we address immediate needs right now. And we're really grateful for organisations like Ahuri doing modelling for us. It's the first time in Queensland we will be undertaking that form of modelling that not only tells us what our housing supply needs to be, but also what are the different types of demand. Many of you are working with our social housing tenants each day and people who may be in affordable housing. And we can't just look at this system as, as the construction of a home. We also need to have a, a conversation and a look at what are all of the appropriate supports that need to go with the delivery of those homes and something I've heard consistently when I've travelled across the state and something we'll obviously be looking very closely at in the development of our longer term plan. But I just wanted to conclude and say thank you very much for the work that you do. Um, I was really pleased. I was at an event last night and I've been at a number of events during this week at the optimism from people in the sector. I think it can be, um, it can be really easy to, be, uh, to let the weight of the, the demand and the pressures um, make you feel really down. And what I'm, what I'm delighted to see is that despite all of those challenges, people are really optimistic. People are coming up with great innovative solutions. And my hope is that we use this opportunity and this time to actually set a long-term plan as, you know, as a nation for where we want housing to go in the future because we don't always get opportunities where people acknowledge why social and affordable housing matters at times when we're going, when the economy is going really well and less people are in need. People don't acknowledge why this sort of social reform and investment matters and I think we've got a unique opportunity right now to set out a blueprint that sets us forward. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to all of the services in Queensland, the organisations in Queensland, and for those of you who have travelled across the state for the work that you do, we are not adverse to stealing great ideas, so if you've got any, please let our department know um, and enjoy the conference. Thanks for having me. If I wasn't living at the youth fire, I'd most likely be living at a friend's house. We're supporting young people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness to find a home. Almost 213,000 forms of housing assistance have been provided to Queensland households, including emergency housing, social housing, private market assistance and homelessness services during 2022 and 2023. We basically got told that uh, we had to move out because they were selling the rental. I seriously thought after two weeks, you know, I'm going to have to go buy a tent. When we got the phone call from Tim, it was... I cried. <laughs> the Queensland Government is investing almost $5 billion in social and affordable housing. We will have commenced 13,500 new social and affordable homes by 2027. We're providing housing assistance and connecting people to support services specific to their needs. We're delivering improvements for people who live in residential parks and retirement villages. And we're ensuring First Nations peoples have a safe and secure home that meets their housing and cultural needs. The Queensland Government is working with First Nations peoples to co-design Our Place, a First Nations Housing and Homelessness Action Plan, 2024 to 2027. Our housing service centres have provided 17,228 bond loans and 5,564 rental grants to help people secure a home in the private rental market.
thank you very much, Minister Scanlon. Uh, and safe and speedy travels back to Parliament House <laughs> for those divisions. In a moment, we'll begin our, our next plenary session, a really important conversation, looking for a way forward for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing. Um, this plenary session is sponsored by the New South Wales Aboriginal Housing Office. So while our, our panellists make, our, make their way to the stage um, and settle themselves in, we'll have a video message from our sponsors, AHO in New South Wales. Thank you. The purpose of the Aboriginal Housing Office is to provide equal access to and choice in affordable housing for Aboriginal people across New South Wales. For many, this can be life-changing. A house is more than just bricks and mortar. A house is a home. It provides certainty, continuity and stability. We never had no air conditioning in the old days. We have a footprint across regional New South Wales, where most of our portfolio lies. The AHO has a diverse portfolio because we have a diverse community. We have a number of five bedroom homes that suit larger families, down to two bedroom places that can suit smaller families or for elders that choose to age in place. Yeah, this year will be good, yeah. Stay there, so, you know, be on my own there. Kids can come and visit now and again. But they're going to move out after five, so I can go to bed. No? <laughs> Underpinning all the work that AHO does is the principle of self-determination. And for that, we rely on strong relationships with stakeholders across the sector. Aboriginal employment is a key driver to our success. First in my family as well to do something like this, wanting to learn and along the way and yeah, on it honestly. Within the Aboriginal Housing Office organisation itself, we have 62% of our employees identify as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. For the Aboriginal Housing Office, Aboriginal service delivery is a key factor in success for the whole community. We engage a number of Aboriginal community housing providers to manage our tenancies and our assets. We look to increase that into the future. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I might just start off by introducing myself. My name is Neil Wilmot, and I'm the CEO of the Peak Body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Housing within Queensland, called Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Housing Queensland, and it's a pleasure to be here on stage with some of my colleagues from other states and territories. I'll just start off by acknowledging the traditional owners and land where we meet, the Yugara and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present and also pay respects to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and importantly, also welcome everyone else who is here, who's travelled in, um, who's come from across the city, who's come locally and from the region. Um, it's great to have you here, thank you. It's a, it's a hard session sometimes after lunch, and certainly after the Minister when she's got all those great news stories, but we're going to talk about something that's very important to us, and obviously to many of you who are still in this room today, and that's around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing and the way forward. Um, I'm going to just start off by introducing our colleagues who are sitting up on stage today so you can hear who they are and where their respective organisations. And then I'm going to ask a few questions and then I'm going to uh, get a couple of questions from the floor uh, for this session. So I might just start off by just saying who the three people are and then let them introduce themselves. But um, to my right here we've got Lisa, Sky in the middle and then Rob on the end. So I might start with you Lisa and just introduce yourself please. Thank you for that, Neil. Um, uh, my name is Lisa Sampson. I'm the CEO of the Aboriginal Community Housing Industry Association, New South Wales. Uh, so it's peak body for Aboriginal housing in New South Wales. Uh, first, may I preface by saying um, thank you very much for the welcome. Uh, and um, we acknowledge that uh, our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander colleagues in the room um, and elders past and present, thank you very much for having us here. Looking forward to a great discussion this afternoon. Oh, thank you, Neil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Sky Thompson. I'm the CEO of Aboriginal Housing Northern Territory. I'm a proud uh, Aranda Kadish woman from Central Australia, born and raised in Alice Springs. 
Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Yarragun Turnbull Nations um, who are upon the lands we meet today and I pay my respects to their families, their elders and the young people. I'd also like to acknowledge the other First Nations people and non-Indigenous people in this room today um, for this important journey. Um, I'll give a bit of a history on AHANT. So, um, in 2017, uh, the intervention was introduced to the Northern Territory. Uh, in response to this, in 2010, uh, Alliance of Aboriginal Peak Organisations came together and formed Aboriginal Peak Organisation NT, which is APON. After a series of community meetings, there was a, a strong push from community grassroots people to regain control over their housing. So in 2019, AHANT was incorporated and funded by the Northern Territory Government. Uh, so a, uh, Aboriginal Housing Northern Territory has been established as the community control uh, Aboriginal peak uh, for, uh, for our organisations delivering housing and housing related services. Uh, we have a strong relationship with our land councils, service providers, the Northern Territory Government, the Australian Government, and we're an important member of the Joint Steering Committee on Remote Housing, uh, and we're currently negotiating a long-term agreement for remote housing in the Northern Territory. Uh, many of them are here today, and I thank them for the genuine willingness to work with the sector. Great. Thank you, Sky. Thanks. And Rob. Um, uh, thanks, Neil. Thanks, Lisa and Sky. Uh, Rob McFarlane, for those that don't know me, I'm a Radjuri man um, from Darlington Point, which is just outside of Griffith, New South Wales. Grew up in Western Sydney. Um, so we're Radjuri. Mob is um, Kelly's, Mars and Edwards. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of NATSIA, which is the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Housing Association. Um, and I, I think through the, through the talk, I'll give a bit more of a background on that here. Um, but we're a, we're a partner of each of our state peak organisations and happy to be here and talk to you today. Thanks for that, Rob, and that's great. Um, so you can see that we've got a few organisations here. We act as peak bodies. A little bit about ours, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Housing Queensland was set up in, uh, in the end of uh, 2020 and formally established in 2021. We represent the interests of the 60-odd uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community housing providers within Queensland itself, so there's a fair few. And we work with our colleagues who are mainstream peak bodies also around improving housing outcomes. Now, I'm going to ask a couple of questions shortly, but I thought I might set the scene a little bit about um, certainly what it's like and some of the situations at the moment without going into too much detail, but just give you a bit of a summary around housing. First and foremost, uh, it'd be remit of me not to say that I'm also an Aboriginal man from far north Queensland originally. Um, on my mother's side, we have connections to the rainforest people around the Mossman Gorge area for people who are from the north of the country. Um, and on my grandfather's side, it's the Wanyagarawa people in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Some people may have heard of Dumaji and other areas. Uh, that's our country too. The reason why I say that is housing means different things to different people. So growing up in a location predominantly coastal for me, um, there was an abundant supply of housing. Uh, yet some of our family who live in remote areas, we don't have that luxury. And the issue that's come up lately has been this issue of supply, and it has been coming around for a long time. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the issue of overcrowding and housing supply has been an issue that has weaned and waned for a period of time, but it's always been constant. But I wanted to start off with just some figures before we start talking about it in particular. The population a couple of years ago was estimated to be about 500,000. We now have the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population that sits around a million people. Um, what hasn't changed dramatically is the number of households that that represents. Um, and we're talking about 210,000 households. So think about it for one minute, about what that may look like and how many people we may have living in a household at any given time. So that's a dramatically different picture than what we have in mainstream Australia with non-Indigenous people. Our population is different. Our population has an upside down population table for people who've worked in health and around demographics where we have a really young population. 33% of our people are under the age of 15. And that's significant because we've got to house them and their housing needs may be different than some of our older population. So there's a lot of things that are different. We've seen changes in overcrowding, it's still a problem. We've seen issues around home ownership as the destination hasn't been agreed to or supported by a lot of people, and some people, to be quite frank, don't want to get there. Um, but we need a roof over our head. And we can't talk about poverty, issues of disadvantage, the issues of 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander education, health, without talking about this fundamental issue of housing people and having enough houses. So I want people to consider when we talk about housing supply, many of you who work with the most vulnerable within this country will understand that we have to house them. And it's not just around giving them a house over their head so their life expectancy is much better, it's all the other pieces that come with it. And I'm hoping that we'll touch on some of that today. But I might start off with, um, I might start with you, Lisa, because you're the closest to me, but um, you've worked for a peak body for a number of times, uh, for a number of years. You also know quite intimately the community housing sector. What are some of the observations that you've made around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing that are challenges? Well, thank you um, for, for um, asking that question, Neil. I think um, for, in New South Wales, you know, there is the reality that there are upwards of 150 Aboriginal community controlled housing providers. These, fo these folks and the organisations they run are authorised by community. They are run by communities. They have, many of them, been operating for decades. Aboriginal community housing providers are not fly-by-nighters. They haven't just arisen yesterday. And so what I guess I'm surprised at is the, in, the almost entrenched um, barriers that they have faced for decades that we are still unpacking in 2023. And I often like to talk about um, barriers being yet, you know, red, yellow and black. You know, there's the red tape of bureaucracy, there's the black tape of um, the kind of hoops you need to jump through when you're an Aboriginal community controlled organisation. And there are certain forms and processes you need to go through in order to get agreement from your community, and that's black business. And then there's also the yellow tape of racism uh, and the lack of courage to, under, uh, to unpick, um, and, I, and I level this at governments and at the broader community, all of the kinds of um, things that have been levelled at Aboriginal people uh, since colonisation. And it's, it's that kind of thinking that we need to unravel at all of those levels collectively as a community. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But Rob, um, what, about, what are your thoughts on some of the challenges that are facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing in this country? I think um, <clears throat> one of the biggest issues that we see and um, is Everyone talks about a housing crisis, and we are. We're in a housing crisis, we're in a homelessness crisis. I'd even go further to say it's a national emergency, and there's a lot of people, like there's, there's this housing conference, everyone's talking about it. But one of the, the challenges is often, because that can be overwhelming, um, people may distance themselves from that or work. There's a lot of projects going on that are concurrent, and everyone's meaning well. Um, but it's a crisis. You know, our people are living in in, in really bad situations and it's just awful. And when you see it or you grow up in it or you experience it, and even myself, I might be in a different situation now because of some of the positions I've been in and, and the, the warriors that have fought before me, that the majority of our people are still in crisis um, and emergency. And so these programs are great. And when we hear government talk about things, it's fantastic. And I've, I've been half my career in government, so I'm not anti-government, but these things are needed to be done. But they're, they're just a ways to go. Um, and so I think that's the biggest part that I see. It's great that there's a spotlight on it, but that spotlight on it is only because we're in an emergency. Um, and before maybe it was class as emergency or the public was talking about it or the media was talking about it as an emergency, it was an emergency for our people before that. Um, so if it's an emergency at mainstream, just imagine what it's like for our people. Um, and so, so that's one of the things I think we need to, we need to grapple with is how do, we, how do we close the gap, pun intended by the way, because there's you know, a report that's quite scathing in that area, but we really need to close the gap. And we can't do it by just you know, running a few programs, even when we're talking in the billions of dollars, it needs that and that's a start. It's not gonna fix it. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it's a good start. No, yeah. that's good. And some of our work that we do is obviously within the urban footprint, but it covers a, a, a lot of sort of uh, metropolitan and regional areas. I'm interested to hear from your point of view, Sky, uh, you know, you both 
have lived in remote areas, uh, you service communities in remote areas. What are some of the challenges that you're facing from a housing point of view in Northern Territory? Yeah, sure. Look, I'm going to focus a bit on homelands. So homelands, um, my background is a uh, service provider um, for homelands. Uh, homelands are uh, community housing, living areas on private land, Aboriginal land, land trusts, uh, which means they're not a fungible asset. They can't be owned, they can't be sold. Um, there's no home ownership uh, in that sector. Uh, the homelands have been uh, neglected for a very long time, uh, underfunded for over 15 years. Um, there has been the welcomed investment of 100 million uh, into the improvement of homelands, but there's still a big gap. Um, uh, when we go to community, homelands uh, and housing are the first things that family are talking about. Uh, on our remote communities, uh, lack of investment uh, there also. There, look, we're welcome that the, at the moment this is the biggest uh, increase of funds to improve uh, remote communities. Um, but over time, with the lack of investment, this has created um, uh, issues where um, we've got an urban drift, where people are moving to town, where um, remote communities um, need to be well invested, and it needs to be a um, it, we need to come up with a, a, an approach where Aboriginal people are a part of the decision-making process, um, not these decisions being made to, um, with them advising. So we're pushing quite strongly for a tripartisan approach uh, so that um, Aboriginal people have a voice at the table for the decisions that are happening um, to our people living in community, homelands, community living areas, uh, town camps. Um, I was privileged enough to grow my kids up in a town camp uh, and then I went into the home ownership um, through IBA. So, um, you know, we've, um, in the NT, uh, we've got a long way to go, but we've got the right people at the table with both the Australian Government, the Northern Territory Government, where we can make a change together. Yeah, great. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think uh, the conversation has highlighted that there's some differences across the country, but there's still a lot of need and undone work. For people who may not be familiar with some of the terminology about community housing providers and uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community housing providers, it's an interesting point. Uh, a lot of these providers were set up in the 1970s, certainly within Queensland. We've got three who celebrated 50 years of operation this year, which is significant. And their reason and purpose of setting up around self-determination in the 1970s was to provide housing and accommodation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who weren't getting access to uh, housing either within government or into the private rental market. The issue for us still is that we have these organisations and they prosper on the idea of um, being able to provide housing for their local community, but there's also a formula for them to be successful and profitable, and that means they have to have stock. So every organisation is different, but we have a number of those across the country. Organisations like Rob and the Peak Bodies, we do a lot of work um, ensuring that these guys are sustainable and here into the future and hopefully the next 50 years. I want to also touch on the point around we have a number of um, challenges that come into light around some of the stuff that Sky had mentioned, and that is not only is remoteness sometimes neglected, the issue is that a lot of good intent has gone into developing frameworks, designs, policies to improve Aboriginal housing outcome, but they haven't been Indigenous-led or Indigenous-designed, and that's um, one of the challenges that we deal with. Um, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander policy writers, uh, people with live life experience, and people who are there to advocate for better outcomes. Now, what I wanted to say is we can't do this alone. And why it's important is to give you a bit of a breakdown in terms of what renting looks like within this country. 60% or 59% at the last census of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander households rent. That's significant because that's not just provided by the people who sit on this stage in terms of our members who provide housing, that's also the private rental market, that also includes government housing. So we know that other people have got to help us with this issue of renting, but where it's really major for people to think about is that 29% of non-Indigenous households rent. So how is it possible that two, uh, twice as many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander households rent, and what do we have to do to address that challenge and either address it through uh, opportunities for home ownership if people want to pursue that, 
or give them access to affordable and appropriate households that meet their families. The challenge that we have around this issue of overcrowding has to be addressed. We can no longer live in an area where we think overcrowding is acceptable, um, nor should we live in areas where we think homelessness is acceptable. So the, the notion has to be put forward that we've got to start thinking about zero homelessness and the idea certainly around zero overcrowding. Otherwise, we'll not get to the root of the problem. Earlier before I come up here, I started talking about some of the stats and I heard a person say, those stats are an underrepresentation, and I've got to be—I've got to agree with that individual's observation. And not every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person does a census, right? We have increased the number of people um, through the hard work of ABS, but we know that there's an underreporting. So the figures that I'm giving you today, in actual fact, the situation uh, at the moment is a lot worse than we probably think it is. So. We're asking, it's a call of arms for people who play in this space, who provide housing services, uh, to listen to some of the solutions that come from here this afternoon uh, so that we can understand better and we can provide a better outcome for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm going to pass over to you, Rob. What do you think some of the solutions are around improving issues that you raised earlier around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing and how we can get some better outcomes? Yep, no problem. So I'm going to talk. Look, I think it's timely because the Close the Gap report from the Productivity Commission has just highlighted really, you know, the, the little movement that there's been to close the gap and certainly in a housing space, but this is across the board. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things at a high level around the priority reform areas, and I don't expect everyone to know what they are, but I, well, I maybe expect that everyone does become to know what they are. You might not, but I'll talk in a way that I think you'll understand. Um, all governments signed up to, you know, to a commitment to close the gap. Um, the reality is it isn't closing, but there's, it's actually quite well written and there's the answers in there if people follow those things. So if I just talk at a priority reform area and it's, it's broken down into intricate levels, so the answers are all there, um, but the ability, I think, really is for people to fully buy into those. Um, so if we just go through the priority reform areas, and I'll talk about some issues, but some solutions that I think are there. Priority reform one area, which is around decision making, and that's true decision making. I think it was Lisa that mentioned it, but we've all mentioned and you know, around decision making. Decision making doesn't mean being consulted or informed about something and then doing it. It means actual decision making. Um, from a point of view of Natsia, we've underclosed the gap with a housing policy partner with the Department of Social Services and that's just kicked off and that's an awesome step in the right direction. But true decision making, decision making and everyone hand on heart here who's from government, if you're from private industry, you've got an opportunity to lean in and, and do things in a real way. Um, um, academics really sort of, you know, have a, have a key role as well. And there's, all, there's the not-for-profit sector, but everyone here, and I'm probably aiming this predominantly at government, if you're doing something and you know what you're going to do and you're going and talking to someone and selling that idea, you've, it's, you've done it wrong. So approach hand in heart. You might have an idea on what you want to achieve, but go properly to the table and thresh it out, and you'll probably be surprised that you'll come up with a better solution than what you originally thought in the first place because the reality is people within our sector, that's our peak organisations, that's our providers, they're really, really good and full of awesome people, and that's in any sector that you work in, but we're here talking about housing, so I'm selfish just going to talk about housing. Um, investment, priority area two around investment into the sector. Um, investment needs to be sustained um, and it needs to be something where you don't turn the tap on and tap off and then want really quick um, uplift and then get angry at the sector when, you know, it might be lagging behind what you may have thought without lived experience it should have taken. So just take sector investment and true investment as a given and it's just how much. And, and then how do you work that out? You talk to the sector and let, and let Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities help you decide what that number is and then stick to it. Stop turning the tap on and tap off. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking to our community when you do it. Um, it hamstrings us. Priority area three, systemic and structural change. This is the biggest one and this is the least amount that I've seen within government. Systemic and structural change under priority area three is about government 
structurally and systemic changing to deliver against close the gap. Newsflash, to me, that means you shrink and you put, you put that investment into the sector, to the community sector, to providers and work with in partnership to do that, rather than getting stimulus funding, half, et cetera. I'm not, like, and look, I've worked in a lot of good organisations, I've seen this done, but the stats are showing that it's not really moving the dial, so it's got to be done more, which means you're getting large investments, how does much of that get to the ground as possible without being eaten up into overhead? So that's where the systemic structural changes are needed. I've worked in government half my career. It's full of awesome people, but the systems are broken. And, and you see it when you're in there, so just be honest. Um, as Stephen Covey says, change occurs at the speed of trust. So, so just be honest, and it will get you so much. There's only one more, and it's data. Um, and I think true data sovereignty and be transparent with data. I've been in government, I've seen how, how paranoid my own areas across a number of sectors, cultural heritage, housing, education, et cetera, get stuck, you know, so caught up in sharing of data, even within government, let alone making that transparent to the, to the sector. Um, so I think academics have a big part to play here because you work with government, but don't engage on, on uh, research around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people ethically, unless the government is going to be totally transparent with that. Get that right at the start, um, because we work with a lot of good, um, a good academic organisations. We have an MOU with um, ANU First Nations portfolio and PDU there. Um, we're in the process of going through that with a lot, another few um, universities that I'll be able to announce shortly. But I find, you know, the academic, it's full of great people, but often it's engaged by government and then the, the, the data isn't made fully available and it should be made from the start. Not some late down, you know, later down the track. So I know I'm talking at a structural level, but I feel like if you address those things, it makes it easy for people. Um, and so from a government point of view, it shows courage. You need courage to do those things. Um, but th those things need to be changed. And the, and the data is showing that that isn't happening. The data is showing that these type of get-togethers and I, and I hear it, I hear it. I'm out at a coffee and I'm, I'm hearing people energised. I love the energy, I've got energy. I'm loving it, I'm meeting people. We're getting ideas and I hear the energy out there. But the data shows that the reality is most people are gonna be energised, then go back to their day-to-day -day job and just do what they did before. Um, or otherwise it would change. And so I just say, just follow it through. Don't, don't stop, follow through from this conference. There's awesome conversations follow it through um, and, and don't fold at the first sign of first barrier. We cop it all the time. So when you get one, you might even get a barrier from a more senior person. From a, you need to keep going. So. so don't get tired. Keep the energy up. Yep. Yep. And understand that there are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who also want a better outcome. So we're here to help and uh, to engage for Indigenous-led solutions. Um, Sky, I'm going to go over to you. Uh, you know, we've spoken about some of the challenges. It's not all doom and gloom. We have seen some things change. We've seen the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander home ownership level rise, so that gap's closing between Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Um, we're seeing a younger population consider purchasing homes now that we've never seen before. Um, we're seeing people getting some educational attainment by having stable accommodation. So it's not all doom and gloom where um, it's a basket case. While there's areas to be improved, what do you see um, and what do you think are some of the things yep. um, that we could do to get better outcomes? Yeah, sure. So I'll go back to the, I hate to keep harping on it, but the intervention had a big impact on our community control organisations. We've had some successful organisations that have survived through this. Um, we've got 16 member organisation. Four of those hold the nurse registration. Uh, they're, they're delivering good quality services and if you were uh, lucky enough to see the Tangajira and the Community Housing Central Australia um, presentation in the think tank, they've got a return to control their housing like they did when their old people um, got things their way. Um, 
Uh, there, we've got success stories like Anne and Diliakwa uh, on Groot Island um, that also uh, are going through uh, stock transfer, housing management transfers. Um, we are also um, got Yili Riang, who uh, is in Darwin based. They deliver uh, wraparound services and they are also looking at um, going out and um, purchasing properties of their own to be able to have control of their own. Uh, 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 their own housing and to apply their own policies which um, works for their people. So we have got success stories. We've got even um, William Junta in uh, Tennant Creek. Uh, Norman Frank is a traditional owner uh, in Tennant Creek. Um, he's gone and accessed his father's land and he's doing his project on his own. Uh, there was an exhibition um, held um, just this week um, where they're, they're, they're uh, announcing that pilot and how he was able to design his own home, how he wants it, um, taking into respect uh, you know, cultural obligations um, and um, designing it how he wanted to live. So there, there are initiatives out there that are happening and we just need to be um, open to um, exploring those. And it is about a system reform, but we're, for the Northern Territory, we're at the beginning of uh, long-term investment and, and, and it's encouraging to see. Yeah, great. Well, that's excellent because the conversation about there is both Indigenous organisations and people who are doing things. That's also a positive story. I think for a long time we've had this expectation that government will help us and do everything for us. Well, that's part of a solution, but it's not the only solution. And certainly within our state, you know, we've got 60 odd Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled uh, housing organisations. A number of those are very successful, award winning. Um, who have provided services to the community for a long time. And one of the benefits would be to build on that success and for organisations that are doing well, for them to have more stock and to be able to house people. We know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are going to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations to get housed. So that's one of the solutions, I guess, in terms of um, seeing more stock either transferred or investors uh, looking at how they can partner with uh, community control organisations to increase the number of stocks so we can house more of our people. Um, Lisa, your role working with um, community control organisations within your state, is there a solution or a role that community control can play in improving housing outcomes? And um, I'm very pleased to say that the answer is yes. Um, of course, there is a, a huge role that Aboriginal community controlled organisations can play. Um, of the Aboriginal community controlled organisations in New South Wales, um, 167 of them are Aboriginal community controlled um, housing providers. 40 of them are nurse registered. Many of them local Aboriginal land councils. Of the 120 local Aboriginal land councils in New South Wales, 114 of them have housing portfolios. And I would encourage each and every one of you to, to follow a logical train of thought. The New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, which uh, got its wings and, and, and took flight as a result of the advocacy of a huge number of tough, strong, smart Aboriginal people, actually have st started that process of land claims, land claims, getting, um, you know, getting up, land getting given back to Aboriginal people. Well, what do Aboriginal people want to do with that land? They want to develop it. They want to build commercial uh, ventures. They want to build housing. This is the logical consequence of land claims and, and successful land claims. And what we have in New South Wales are organisations that have got skin in the game. They're ready to develop the land that they have. They're ready to develop into partnerships. They, they are eager for partnerships. And I'll go back to the things that, that Rob and, and Sky have said about collaboration. What do we all do when we collaborate? We bring the best of ourselves to a partnership. And that's what Aboriginal community controlled providers um, and Aboriginal community controlled housing providers in New South Wales do. They bring the best of themselves to it because they've got strengths. It's not just all doom and gloom as, yeah. as Rob's alluded to and Sky's alluded to. There are a whole range of assets. There is cultural capability. There is project management expertise. There's risk and management, uh, you know, compliance expertise. There's property management. There's, and, and of course, the thing that Aboriginal community controlled housing providers excel at and those of you who are familiar with the NERSH um, you know, seven pillars will be, con will be uh, very familiar with um, the pillar around tenancy management. Well, I'm very proud to say that of all subsections of NERSH providers in Australia, what New South Wales ACHPs kill it over 
is tenancy management. Really great tenancy management because they understand people. And why do they understand people? Aboriginal community controlled organisations are those organisations that Aboriginal people themselves gravitate to because they know that they're going to be treated in a holistic manner. And that's really why Housing First matters and why it's so important to, him, um, to support the ACHP sector um, in, in collaborations. And I encourage partnerships of all sorts in order to take advantage of the many strengths um, that are available uh, in the Aboriginal community controlled housing provider sector. Great. That's excellent. So that's one area in terms of that. But I've got to ask a question to some of the panel who, uh, for some of us who have worked in government for a period of time, uh, what's the role of government in this? How can government also accelerate and um, improve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander outcomes? I'm not saying that they're not doing it. Mm. Most state and territory jurisdictions have sort of either a commitment or an action plan or some strategy around improving it. Um, but tell me, what, what could government do? What message would you just say to government if government had your ear right now? Um, the minister was still in the room or uh, Minister Collins was here. What would you be saying to government about um, how they can play a role? Yeah, um, can I go first, Guy? Yeah. Um, look, I think that government can help immensely because, as I'd said earlier, there's awesome people in government. It's like, like I was there, a lot of us have been in government and then you're in the sector and so government has a lot of skill um, and that's both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and, and non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that really can help and grow um, and grow the sector. When I've been in private sector, it's generally been in consulting, but it's, it's, it's interesting when you're in private sector, someone will engage you to do something, so you're then doing it knowing that at some point you're gonna step away and you're not gonna be needed. But, if, but government does things and it just feels, because I've done some really good things in programs, but I'm going back to close the gap, but the evidence is showing, like often it's done, but it's not done with a full thing to done, do and hand over. And so if I think if government looked in that lens of saying we're doing this so it can be delivered through the sector, um, community housing sector, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community housing sector, truly, um, I think that's what can be done. I think things like stock transfers, I, like the, you know, I, I could go on all day around this one, but what I really feel that, the, that is, is, is something that it wouldn't, it's just a mind shift change and it can be done right now is there's a lot of good people and there's a lot of informa you know, skills transfer that could happen right now if it was done um, in good faith with a view to the sector picking that up rather than a view to delivering against money on, based on a scope and saying we've done it and then moving on to the next thing. So okay. look longer term, um, have specific plans for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, commit to those um, and, and back it up. Back it up with you know, um, the, the priority areas that I'd said before, decision making, true investment, make data available um, and, and, and look at your own organisation and go, what isn't working and what can we change in this environment to help deliver that rather than we're government so we're constrained by this funding fiscal cycle and that and I can't do that because I'm in caretakers. Let's just stop saying all that because I, I, I don't believe you. I've been in government. It's not true. People hide behind it. It's, it's, it's not true. And like, I, I know there's people there going, no, it is true. It's not true. <laughs> I've been an executive in, in government and it's true to a degree. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. I think it's a really important piece. It's not about kicking the head of governments. They're actually yeah. our partners and they're critical friends yeah. in many ways. I don't think we necessarily see them as that because sometimes they might introduce legislation or a barrier and we're saying, well, you don't get us or you don't want to be part of us. We've got to understand it. So it's a two-way thing, but there's certainly work that we can do together. Yes. Um, I noticed uh, in Queensland, I had the privilege of being involved in the NAPARI program, which is a lot of the remote housing that um, in some way or form went for about 10 years and then a little drib and drab on the extension of it past 2018. But um, there's a really important role that government played in there and that was making investment available for us to build more dwellings within this mm. state. And um, that would never have happened if we just relied on um, either us as organisations doing it 
Um, so those cash injections around investment make a big difference. And I guess for any of us who've worked in government, certainly around the finance role, that we do have competing priorities from time to time. Um, it's not always about the loudest voice necessarily, but evidence plays a really important role. And Rob had spoken earlier about this issue around data collection and evidence. Uh, anyone who's worked in a health background will know that evidence-based medicine has been around for a long time. And certainly in the work that we do in housing, it's actually uh, imperative that we have reliable evidence that we can use to advocate for things that are different. You can't sit back and say that it's acceptable to have um, overcrowding uh, in three out of five homes. You can't say it's acceptable to have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, homeless at rates that are eight times that of non-Indigenous people. You can't say it's acceptable for us to have a look at people and say that your rental stability is not there because we're going to move you through a system or um, you make a one breach and you're out. So there's a lot of stuff. I guess, what's your take on this, Sky? Because you've had to also work with the government. We noticed that there's a $100 million in, uh, inward investment from the Commonwealth uh, into the NT. Um, what has been your experience and what do you think um, are some of the sort great things that can be done by government. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, it, with the Northern Territory, we're at the beginning of a long uh, journey. Um, we've got um, positive engagement with um, government. We know we need them as partners. We want them to trust in us, um, commit to the long-term journey, um, support along the way, given um, where the position of, um, of our community control organisations, have trust in us, work with us, um, and we can work together to, to improve things for our, for our people on the ground. Great. So trust is a really important piece, and it goes back to mm. a quote that Rob had said. What was that quote again? Uh, it's, it's by Peter Kerr's at the rate of trust, or is it, I don't know if that's the exact words, but it's, it's yeah. yeah. Well, I think trust is the important yeah. piece, is, is the word here. Trust I, I, occurs at the rate, at yeah. the speed of, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to leave it as just um, what government can do or do better. I don't want to leave it as what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community control organisations can do better. Because there's a lot of you out there today who don't fit into either of those camps. Mm. So I'm going to put it to Lisa. What do you think about partners and what roles can partners, might be NGOs, might be education facilities, um, they might be financiers, as an example, or investors. You know, don't talk specifically, but are they critical friends of us? Can they make a difference? Look, um, absolutely, Neil. And I think that it, it's right and proper for us to talk about partnerships in the broadest sense, as Neil has, uh, has already intimated. Whether or not you are government, you're an academic institution, you're a mainstream CHP, um, you, you know, whatever those, uh, whatever role that you seek to play in a collaboration or in a partnership, what, is, what, what needs to happen is those roles need to be clearly defined. Um, that, that's really the key here because when you, we think about um, the kinds of collaborations that, uh, that ACHPs have not been party to. I mean, in New South Wales, the state that, are, that I come from, um, mainstream community housing providers um, were, uh, you know, had the benefit of not only property management transfers, but title transfers. And that happened over a number of years. We're still looking at Aboriginal community housing providers not having been considered in all of those historic transfers. And so in terms of um, equity and, and repositioning them um, to, you know, with all of their strengths, um, but having had been overlooked for so long, well, we now have the benefit of being able to learn from those things that have actually occurred. Hasn't been great, shouldn't have happened, equity terrible, all those things. But you know what we can do is, okay, well, those things have happened. If we're going to now move to this desirable state, these are the kinds of ways we can do it with different sorts of partnerships. And I would encourage you all to put your thinking caps on outside of the scope of, oh, uh, we've got an MOU with this um, Aboriginal community controlled organisation down the road to hold hands and be friends and get them to give us cultural guidance. That's, <laughs> you know, that's one thing and, and, and it's great and, and it is right and proper, but that's the first step. Because the next step is to go, what, of, what things of great moment can we deliver to our Aboriginal communities um, and also to, and, and what can those Aboriginal communities lend to 
the greater Australian communities in which we operate, because there, that, this is, there is a symbiosis. And it's only by creating those partnerships that you're going to discover what they are. And you're going to discover what they are because you're going to be involved in local partnerships. So it's going to be local solutions developed in collaboration with Aboriginal community controlled organisations, the communities that authorise them. Right. Well, there's some really strong messages coming here from the panel today, and that's around collaboration works, uh, trust is important. Um, we're all in this together to improve outcomes. And there's Indigenous-led solutions that are out there uh, if you only take the time to access the questions or involve us as an equal partner in um, providing those. I'm going to move to a couple of questions because there's people around the audience. I can't see everyone, but I know there'll be a bit of a roving, roving mic. Uh, thank you for turning those lights up. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have come in um, from our virtual guests that are online. So I might take to the panel one of these questions. One is decision making. How do we change the current framework from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controls being downstream with the cup um, from the actual decision makers being upstream with the power? How do we change that? Well, if I can go to where we're, for an example, we're entering into the, we're, we're working towards a new national partnership with remote housing and we think that it's time that we're uh, equal partners with the government. So tripartisan approach yep. um, would be beneficial to our, uh, our as a peak representing our members. Uh, it'd be um, really great to explore whether that's something that we could enter into. So you're talking about equal partnership regardless of if one party's got the power through maybe investment or finance, that means nothing. You're saying be equal partners at the table. Be at the table making decisions, not um, an, an advisory level. It's great that we're a part of the Joint Steering Committee, yep. um, but it'd be good to have a formal agreement where we're mm -hmm. investing in long-term commitment to remote housing, improving service delivery, um, new builds, all, all wraparound services being at the table. So we've all got a part of this together. Right. What about you, Lisa? I think that's a great question, and what I um, and, and so thank you to whoever asked it. Um, but I, I am, I'm brought to mind of um, the CEO of Warramai Local Aboriginal Land Council, um, just on the um, just above, uh, just north of Newcastle in New South Wales. Um, his name's Andrew Smith, and um, I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase him because I don't think I can be uh, trusted enough to quote him directly. Um, but Andrew, at our um, 2023 Aboriginal Housing Caucus a couple of weeks ago, gave a beautiful presentation about how Warramai Land Council has developed. And if you haven't been to Marook Cultural Centre, I th thoroughly um, in, in, encourage you to do that. It's a marvellous museum, art gallery, event centre, land council, um, series of, um, of camps. They run quad bike riding, etc. Anyway, I'm not tourism in New South Wales, but... Um, <laughs> but Andrew, when he was presenting to us, said, look, it's taken us 20 years to develop this great site, and we, we held our conference there. So this, this great event centre that you see, and, we, we, and there were lots of people, um, people on the board, they didn't want this when it first happened. Um, but I tell you what, this has all been developed largely with our money, because what he believes is that you go to government, you put your hand out, they give you a bit of money. You go back to government again, I'll give a bit more money. By the time you're there, you've gone five times, you're dependent on it. And he goes, and that's not what we wanted to do. So Warramai Lauk didn't do that. They chose to strike their own path. They went and they developed other sorts of partnerships. They, they charted a path there that enabled them to put, to put themselves in the driver's seat in terms of decision making. And so what I would encourage you all to do is to strike that path, whatever that looks like, for you, it's, a, it's going to be idiosyncratic, and the best pathways are, you know, I mean, there, I know we've read lots of books and, 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 and refer to lots of role models and, and, and people that have gone before us, um, and, and they gave, give us some great ideas, but essentially the path that we all strike in collaboration um, with our communities, um, the best ones are idiosyncratic. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And Rob, is there um, anything? Yeah, look, I, I think there's so much opportunity here, and I, th I think the... Like if I put, when I was back, you know, in government hat on from a decision making, being at that table, yes, there you might get money that's come down and it's conditioned in certain ways. But somewhere within that, there's scope to put some decision, we, you know, we can truly make decisions around these parts, possibly around the implementation. What's best is if we're at the table negotiating before 
um, things are going up to Treasury and saying what's needed and what not. Um, but you can. There is scope to make decisions. It might not be full decision making, and, not, and I think that's some of the fear mongering. Oh, well, if the community comes in, they'll just tell us they don't want to do that, they want to do this. But if it's clear and you develop trust and you say, look, we've got these parameters that we have to deliver in, how can we do this best? Um, and then you're at the table and then it's truly respected. So if someone, if community then, community and community could be at a local level, it could be you know, something at a state through one of the state peaks, it can be at a, at a Commonwealth level, um, but truly respect that decision and actually make it sort of carry weight. And I think it will only pay dividends. It won't slow you down, it will speed things up because then the implementation of whatever is decided from that program will be accepted by the group that it's landing on. It's just, to me, it's a no-brainer. No, that's great, thank yeah. you. And from my perspective, I guess the thing, this issue around um, uh, finance is a very interesting one for me because over many years, I've actually been able to see trends in investment, where it's gone and so forth. But this is where I say knowledge is power. Uh, fundamentally, you need to know actually how much money is available. And what is real money that's available? Not the money that the department might get each year, and because not all of that is available. Some of it will go into wage cost and other cost within the department. But from a program point of view, or, or if you're looking at a government agency in particular, uh, the knowledge comes from knowing exactly how much money is available within a program area that's available to go out the door. And this idea of going cap in hand Cap is one thing, but you've got to have an idea of what the pie is. So once you get an idea of what the pie is, well, you can ask for as big of a slice as you want. Right? And I think this is one of the things that historically has been problematic for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and uh, leadership has been understanding exactly what's available and being able to pitch with a, a, a sound argument about why you should get a large portion or a bigger portion that's higher than a 4% population type arrangement. Now, I'm not saying that's always there. The second thing would be is to be really strong around advocating that there's got to be Indigenous specific programs and there's got to be a commitment to it. What we have done has broken, is broken. It hasn't worked. We would not be seeing what we're seeing today in 2023, if all the good intent and uh, all the goodwill and um, the best policy in the world um, was implemented. So it's not true. So you've got to call it out. And don't be afraid to call it out and say that you feel that this is not quite right and you believe that there should be a larger proportion going to a particular vulnerable group, whether it's Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander or another um, subset that you may work with, around funding. Okay? It's up to people who have got the bucket of money to work out how it's divvied up. They don't own it. They're public servants. All right? They serve us. We're trying to serve the community. And for too long this has happened. Now, I've worked in government for a long time. I'm not down on government because they're a valuable and critical partner of ours. But let's get real. If we're continuing to do the same things that we're doing and we've done for the last 20, 30 years, we will not get Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing outcomes. If our investment stays the same in terms of what is a line item or what is allocated for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and the commitment is only lip service by that putting First Nations first or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and housing is important, that's nonsense. We're at a stage now where we've seen a mature argument across the state and across the country where we should be able to look back and say, we have got decades of experience here mm. and we can see where the failure is. And that includes on our side of the equation. So time's changed, right? Okay, and I'm not talking to anyone new here, but this is the reality of what we're living in within 2023. We're talking about a sense of urgency that not everyone sees, but they're willing to walk past a person who's struggling. They're willing to accept disadvantage. They're willing to accept poverty. They're willing to accept poor educational attainment. And they're willing to accept poor health outcomes. That's nonsense in a progressive and a developed country like Australia. So we've got to look at it. The thing I would add to the issue around government and also to other people is government's not the only one with funds. That's right. There's institutional investors. We've had programs around the world that have opened up opportunities for people to put money into housing, and not just minority housing, I'm talking about it housing the most vulnerable. Mm. 
right? We've got to make opportunities available for them, and sometimes they're government levers that cost government nothing, but in actual for, uh, create a benefit for the people who can create and put investment in. The government's got a piece of the pie, but we haven't done anything to attract corporate Australia, uh, with the exception of pockets across the country, into housing, and we can do a lot more there. And I think there's a lot of support and interest from some of the more socially conscious corporations within this country to invest in housing if there's an opportunity that could be a win-win for both of them. I'm going to answer, uh, ask one more question. One is, how does, because Rob, I'm going to start with you because you spoke about closing the gap, and then I'm going to go to the audience if there's questions. Um, how does Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing workforce development align with closing the gap and reforms? Is there anything about workforce and workforce development in there? Uh, yeah, well, we, we could have done a whole day session on this, I think. But um, look, workforce and workforce development is... Um, like private companies spend a lot of time on, on, on workforce development. Government spends a lot of time on workforce development and mobility. But um, I think everyone, we need to look at our sector as a whole. One comment I will make, and it's been mentioned or weaved throughout a lot of our comments, is there is massive skill within our workforce. Like I'm surprised, like I've been in the private sector, the public sector, I've been on a couple of not-for-profit boards, but now I'm working in the not-for-profit sector and I'm just blown away. Like, and I would even sort of hazard a guess in the, in the, in the consulting space, I was working with a lot of startups and VCs and private equity firms, but the, the knowledge in this space is, is I, I've just learnt so much from the amount of skill. Um, but because of our population, that skill and, and who has paved the way, I mentioned some worries earlier, but I'm looking at a couple in Ivan Simon and Mary Doctor and, and others that have paved the way for us. There, we, where there's not many of us. So although we've got skill everywhere, um, there's not many of us to go around. And so I think as a sector, we have to look at the sector and look at that mobility. Um, within the sector, there's a disparity between conditions that are in government or the private sector and our sector. So often working within the sector, you're doing that um, out, of, out of duty to do the right thing and that's not sustainable for the long term so I think it needs to be needs to be looked at but there's certainly um, you know it, it is difficult to attract people to our sector then it's difficult to hold um, because they can be attracted away elsewhere for, for people that pay more so often you're going on people come in because they've got a sense of duty and I'm not saying there's not a sense of duty if you're in the private sector or public sector I've been there but, but it's, it's difficult, so it really needs to be looked at, and I think there's just such opportunity to do that. But from a rewarding point of view, it's, there's nothing that's been more rewarding than, than my 10 months in Natsia. Um, and I think anyone that's worked in the sector in any form, when we talk, this, this just resonates. But it needs to be looked at strategically, and it needs money, it needs a plan. And like I say, private sector large, Multinationals will have it. The government has it across at every state and territory. We need to look at our, our sector. Look, we do have some... <laughs> um, I'm sure there's people from NIAA in here. We have some funding to look at this. And so we are go we are, we're, we're certainly looking at this, but that's going to be looking at what's needed, and then it's going to be a pretty big ask. But we need to... Um, and Sky and Lisa and everyone's talking about this all the, to other to all the time, so I'm sure my colleagues have got things to say as well in this matter. Yeah. Well, that's great. So it sounds like there's some work that's being done. Um, maybe the alignment, we have to look at a lot more closer to the person who asks that question. Um, but there's certainly some work around workforce development and uh, it, it's seen as a really important piece and I'm sure it is for many of you and your organisations, regardless of if you work in the Aboriginal space or not. So I might just move to the floor if there's any questions to ask the panel um, before we wind up. Now, could I just get the lights turned up a little bit more, please? Uh, and there's a question no, over here. Over Sorry, I apologise. <laughs> there's um, a couple of bright spotlights and I can't quite see, but there's a question over yeah, here. I understand that it's very difficult for you guys to see us when we're trying to um, enable the microphones for people to ask questions because it's so bright there and it's so dark here. Like, we can see each other very well, but it's difficult for you to see us, so... Yes. Thank you, Neil. Uh, my name is Peter McMillan from NT Shelter, based in Darwin. I'd like to just um, 
commend uh, the work of Sky Thompson, my colleague on the panel, uh, and to Rob. Um, I'd just like to say that from a, I guess from a mainstream housing peak body in the Northern Territory, we absolutely support the important work that Sky does and her team uh, in ensuring that housing is back in Aboriginal hands uh, and that Aboriginal people are talking about the housing needs for their people in community and all power to you Sky, you're doing a wonderful job. Um, I just wanted to share, if I could, uh, Neil, one of the things that you said before about housing uh, funding to where it's needed most. And, and in Northern Territory, we've just put in a, a supplementary submission to the National Housing and Homelessness Plan uh, on that very point, uh, where we receive 1% of the national funding for housing and homelessness, despite having 12 times the rate. And people who might wish to engage and support that can find our submission online. But I did want to share with the conference, because I think it's timely right now, that we've just had news come through um, around something that's very real for our First Nations people with severely overcrowded housing. 54% of our houses are still overcrowded uh, in remote communities. And preventable diseases of poverty, like rheumatic heart disease, trachoma and scabies are still very endemic in a lot of our communities. Uh, I'll just read this all I can. And for Brisbane-based or Queensland-based people here, they'll know uh, the artist Ben Quilty. Um, we're very privileged in the Territory to have Simon Quilty, his brother, who's working on that project that Sky uh, described before, the Willia Junta demonstration project in Tennant Creek, and this came through just now. I've just received an email from Jenny, one of our main voices. Her 10-year-old passed away suddenly this morning. He had suffered from rheumatic heart disease and lived in a very overcrowded house. He came with us to Barapunta and had so much life force, the poor boy. It's a terrible example of the need for more housing. She lived without power or water for 20 years. That just shows how far we've still got to go for our First Nations people with housing in 2023. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I want to uh, touch on a bit of that because for many of you who are sitting in this audience, you may not be aware, but we do have sometimes different housing standards for remote areas. Um, and they might be as simple as we don't have uh, down pipes in areas. Um, in some areas, we don't have people connected to power. Um, other things that people may take for granted in an area where you may have fencing, you may have outdoor lighting, um, there's a lot of things that are a little bit different. And it's like a hidden secret within this country that people don't know some of this stuff. So when we're talking about an end consequence, where uh, my background is public health, but if it is rheumatic heart disease or an, uh, something that is preventative, um, that is unbelievable for me that we are still talking about that with the amount of technology, insight, education and awareness that we have around those particular issues that we have uh, a portion of our population that are still dealing with some of these things. So um, thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, even though it was a sad uh, story, it was part of reality. If I can go to the next question or comment. Yeah, OK, thank you. Here as well. Kia. Thanks, Michael. A question here. Uh, hello there. Uh, thanks for your, your discussion so far. We've just had uh, uh, the unveiling of the Housing Australia Future Fund. I was just wondering what uh, you've been discussing with uh, Housing Australia or the Future Housing Australia organisation on how the funds are going to be distributed, how much can be distributed, and are there any uh, variations or advice you'd be giving to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can get a fair share of the action? Um, a great question, and I might start with that. For people who um, are not familiar with the Housing Australia Future Fund, it is one of six sovereign funds that we have within this country that have been set up to look after the long-term um, area of, of need, and we have those for uh, other categories. They're governed by a, a board um, uh, who oversees that and makes investment decisions so that that fund is there into perpetuity and that we are able to spend the benefits that come off it. Um, the Housing Australia Future Fund is an interesting one for us because um, we know that there's been money put into it. We've probably argued at different times that there should be more than the allocated amount into it. But 
if I was to be brief to your, uh, the question that was asked from the floor is that we have certainly made um, commentary and advocacy um, to the Australian Government about the Housing Australia Future Fund. We've mentioned the idea of quarantining a certain proportion of that money to go towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing. Um, we're very cautious that um, about how those formulas are done um, and what consideration is put to those. So in, sh in a short response to your question is we have absolutely um, advocated for a portion of that money to be set aside for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including other types of future investment and programs that are put forward around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing, including numbers for uh, first home ownership grants, et cetera, et cetera, across the country where we feel that there should be a higher proportion of uh, that set aside. And the figure that we've been playing with is 20% of any of those program funds, um, including any of those investment funds, because we have got so much catch up to do to improve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, good one. Just to add to that, Steve, is um, what Neil had mentioned is um, look, we're at all the tables. We've done, we've had those conversations with Minister Collins all the way through. We have put in submissions. Um, do talk to Nathan Dalborn quite regularly from NIFIC, so we've got a good relationship there. Um, talk to Kirsty Moore at IBA, and we're working together on, you know, on looking at how we can work together um, differently. We've been trying to influence dedicated percentages. There is that 200 million portion that goes to regional and remote, which brings in another government department, NIAA, which are a good partner of ours as well. Um, and we're talking to them around that area. But we, but we haven't, like, like everyone else, we're waiting, waiting for that investment mandate and there hasn't been an agreement on. So we don't, we probably, we don't have any more information or inside information than any of the, than, you know, Community Housing Industry Association or Shelter or Homelessness New South Wales or Homelessness Australia would have and all the, we, we, we're, but we're having conversations. We're at the table. Um, we're advocating, we're wanting to know more. Um, but, but yeah, don't know any more than, than I'd imagine you would at the moment. I think it's really important, so, sorry, Elise, but I, I just wanted to mention this issue of uh, a quarantining a number of it. And, and while it's not so much rubbery and while we're asking for a larger portion is the cost. So if we were to do a demographic profile of where people live, and we know a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in urban locations, that's one thing. But if we look at remote Australia and how much it costs to build a dwelling or to set up a dwelling or to put infrastructure, those costs are significant. So while I applaud 100 million going into the Northern Territory, it's not quite enough. Mm. If I have a look at the billion dollars that we had through Napari over a 10 year period, it's not enough. The success of building 1,100 homes was great, but we could probably double that number. So the investment has to be big. So when we're developing in some of these areas where costs are higher, um, we've got to either come up with uh, innovative products that lower the cost, and we haven't been able to do it with even some of the best mines that we've got in this country. Uh, and if we're going to continue to build on available land that is there, knowing that it's going to cost you in excess of $1.5 million to build a three-bedroom dwelling in a remote area, let's get real about how far does $100 million go? How far does a billion dollars go? Now, we've got to get past this notion of seeing these figures as big figures. They're not big figures. Mm. For a person who might be on a $100,000 income, you know, you, you hear that, um, or you, someone who's on 50000 or on a pension, they're big figures. But let's get real in terms of the amount of money that we have going through uh, government and corporate Australia and what the proportion of need is and what we actually need. So we've got to have different formulas. We've got to have different modelling around some of the money that needs to go to the most vulnerable. And I'm not just talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I'm talking about vulnerable people in Australia. So we address these issues um, in a better way. The idea of sitting here and hearing an announceables about $100 million, $600 million, to me, sometimes I think they're a rounding error because I get to look at bigger sums than those. So I'm not being derogatory but let's get real about what is the need and where do we need money? Does it mean we need redirection from another portfolio into housing? And we should be advocating for that. We shouldn't sit back and expect public servants to do the advocacy internally or wait for a treasury allocation to come out um, because this is what they can afford. 
We should be talking about what the real need is and why aren't we competing with health portfolios and education portfolios for the funding that we get within respective jurisdictions. And until that happens, we're not going to get to this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, did you want to add something yeah, to that? I, I, I did want to add something, Neil, and that is that um, in New South Wales, we have very clearly advocated um, in, in respect of the New South Wales public housing waiting list, uh, a full one third of the people on, that appear on the New South Wales public housing waiting list identify as Aboriginal. We have, we have advocated for a full 33% of government allocations, whether it's under the Housing Australia Future Fund, whether it's under the Social Housing Accelerator Fund, uh, to be allocated um, to Aboriginal community housing and specifically to the Aboriginal community housing provider sector. Because as Carolyn Viney, uh, who um, was a, gave a great presentation as part of a panel uh, yesterday morning, was saying, um, really, we can't re be relying on government and government can't, through the funds that they have available, fix the whole problem. Really, we're looking at government funds as top up, but what we can do is we can, we can, um, we can put into place um, a multiplier effect with Aboriginal community com controlled organisations being able to then utilise this, build their balance sheet, and as many of the um, community housing providers have done, certainly in New South Wales, start, started then building their own pipelines um, that are not reliant on government funding or, um, or, or, or government-backed loans, low-interest loans. So I think that's what, and, and given the fact that so many Aboriginal community-controlled housing providers do have land that they can contribute to projects, it is, it, it is ludicrous to think that ring fencing would not work and that ring fencing would not then encourage other forms of investors to, to, to have a really good strong look at the partnerships that they can strike with Aboriginal community controlled housing providers. Great, good work. Okay. I've got one more question online. I've got room for two more questions here before I'm going to have to close the session. Uh, there's another question here. Thanks, Neil. Um, Kathy Utrich from the Catholic Archdiocese of Brisbane. Um, and while my question is more probably relevant for yourself, Neil, um, I suggest for the other panel members um, that they do a similar approach to their archdiocese. Just about 12 months ago now, we did a land audit of the Archdiocese of Brisbane. And while it says it's the Archdiocese of Brisbane, it's actually the southeast corner. Um, so we go all the way up to Maryborough, out to the Toowoomba Range and down to the New South Wales border. That initial land audit identified about 90 parcels of vacant, underutilised land across our 94 parishes. Now, the archdiocese and the parishes are really keen um, but don't have the skill set to um, activate, we've called the whole project actually, Project Activate, activate those underutilised and vacant blocks of land. And we're totally agnostic as to who we partner with, um, with the CH and or government and whoever just to activate that land to deliver mission basically uh, and and the only caveat around that in delivering mission is you know we provide for the vulnerable so my question is um, you know I was very interested in the last last bit of your conversation about strategic partnerships and partnering um, that was that would be something uh, that would be really interested in in having a further conversation about whilst we are in discussions with the Queensland state government or, or around the more metropolitan based sites uh, we certainly do have a lot of land in the more rural and regional um, north and south coast areas and um, I'd be very um, very happy to continue that conversation in, in around partnerships and partnering because our parishes we we have the asset we don't have we don't have the money to developers we're not developers um, we don't have the money to develop it we, you know the parishes don't even have enough money to put in a development application fee um, let alone do all of the road you know, the other work that goes into project managing uh, delivering social and or affordable housing so um, so yeah so very happy to continue that conversation if that's something um, that you'd be interested in well, Cathy, thank you. Well, I can certainly talk on behalf of our state. We'd be very interested in having a further conversation about it. And there's certainly members in that footprint that you've just spoken about who have both um, an ability to partner and be a developer as well as um, just go into a joint venture with um, the parish. 
around um, around those opportunities. So. Um, what we say is everything's on the table. Let's talk. This is a, let's get real about this. And I've said this before. If there are people in this room who have got opportunities, and those opportunities may not sit with a government partner, um, come and talk to us. No, we might say to you, no, we can't do anything. But we might also have some solutions that may be able to help you and other organisations that are respective of where you are, state or territory, um, talk to one of the peak bodies who might be able to link you with potential members in that area who may be able to help you. The other thing that I would say that's really important is strategic partnerships isn't new for us. Many of us have already formed those partnerships with developers and others around the idea of one day we will inherit a land bank potentially or a partner who may have an opportunity for development. So we're thinking on the, uh, on the uh, being forward and saying like, we haven't got that opportunity now, but there may be someone who's thinking about partnering with us. So we're trying to pull together the best heads that we can around that. And obviously don't dis, uh, disregard government. They've been a partner for us for a long time too. So there's other ways that we can do it. Yeah. The other flip side of that is we've also got organisations that have land banks. And from time to time, they're looking for partners to help them develop their land bank. So um, everything's on the table. So thank you for your comment, and um, if anyone could um, could share what Cathy's got, we're, we're, we're here to, um, <laughs> to have that conversation. Uh, one more question, and, uh, and then I'm going to move to the last one that's been asked online and, and wrap up. Yeah. Oh, man. It's hard. <laughs> I need this. All right. I'll take two. There's one here and one here. Yep. Uh, Travis Gilbert from ACT Shelter. I'm also Vice Chair of National Shelter. Uh, in the context of the last eight weeks, I think every single government MLA has been out spruiking the Yes campaign, which is great and fine. But we are a, an urban jurisdiction with none of the remote building costs that other areas experience and we still have a Koori girl 12 times as likely to be able to tell you what a homelessness service looks like when she starts school. We have Aboriginal people who are nearly half as likely to retire with home ownership as the rest of the Territory's population. We are the only jurisdiction with no community controlled housing. What can I do as an advocate and what can other Canberrans who are here perhaps do to amplify the voices of community and make our government do more than talk the talk? Great question, thank you. I might start with you, Sky. What would you, your advice be? Um, advice would be listen. Um, listen to our community control organisations that have been doing it uh, for a very long time, who have the connections with our grassroots people who are speaking, are working, um, are, are relationship building, our relations to work with them and talk with them to understand how, how you can best support. And I would add to that, so the, the comment was that there wasn't community control yeah. within that sector, but um, I do know the ACT, and, and let's not uh, forget that there are, where there's a gap in the market where it may not be an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander housing provider, there's often an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander health service. Yeah. And a lot of those are also advocates around housing outcomes. Uh, while we don't see those as housing providers, there's certainly community control and we'll have a voice and talk about how um, you can advocate for better housing outcomes from a health perspective. So we shouldn't forget that. Yeah. Mm. Rob, did you have a...? Oh, look, I, I think what's been said is, is the best advice, but, you know, Travis, you know, from a, from a Natsia point of view, we're, well, you know, we're on the Shelter Council and Shelter's a huge ally of Natsia, so let's talk around that because from a Natsia point of view, we're working with our Peaks and Peaks partners, but we're working with government and all the states about addressing where there is a, there is a gap of a peak. And so we haven't cracked that fully, as in from an Australian point of view, because we see gaps, but we're having conversations. So I would suggest that we, we catch up and talk about those, but the, the comments made by Neil and, Neil and Sky, I suppose in the interim, uh, are great things to look at, but um, but yeah, those those things are, are being looked at. Governments are thinking around those, but but people are living, and I think this is Travis's point. And if anyone knows Travis, he's constantly thinking about this, which is why he's such a such a strong warrior. He's always thinking of the individual on the ground, and it's a good reminder that these are real people. It's not just statistics; it's people with real issues. Um, so yeah, let's have more conversations around that, mate. Great, thank you. And there's a question over here, and then I might move to the final question. Where would that be found? Uh, 
Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks for adding one more question or comment. Um, so I'm Steve Lucas. I'm with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, and, and I just wanted to offer sort of a comment from HUD's perspective, the U.S. perspective. You know, my office oversees what we call Native American block grants for housing and community development. And so during this discussion, I've been thinking about at HUD and in the U.S. context, we have about 600 federally recognized indigenous tribes. And self-determination is a cornerstone of our programs. So the funding that goes through that block grant doesn't have a lot of strings. There doesn't need to be sort of annual negotiation or project by project discussion. Um, there's, um, since Nahasda was passed in 1996, there's um, negotiated rulemaking that took place that set the formula for these like annual grants for housing and community development. And the other piece is sovereignty, right? So it's, we really do try to respect native tribes as it's a nation to nation relationship. And so I think partnership is really powerful. Um, I think it's a tool in this context, but for us, I think, you know, the challenge is making sure the funding keeps up with the need. And that's something that, you know, it's a, it's a struggle in the United States as well. Um, but I'm just, I'm curious for the, the panel to sort of reflect on self-determination, right, as a cornerstone value and how much in this current context you're able to effectuate that self-determination and how far from real self-determination do you feel given the current policy context? Wow, what a wonderful question and what a great <laughs> example uh, of the US, thank you. Um, self-determination in this country has been around for a long time. A lot of our parents and grandparents have fought for self-determination for, um, for us to have our own rights and set our own way and our own um, way of doing things. Um, self-determination is often um, embodied by community control organisations. So all of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, control organisations have self-determination as one of their pillars of the way that they operate. What you're talking about is how does that go from a commitment to self-determination, living self-determination, to the reality of making it possible. One of the things we don't have in this country, which is different than the US and to a point Canada, is we don't have a self-determination type approach to grant funding. So generally, um, we can say that this is about self-determination, this is something that we believe is better for our community, but the way that procurement is run within this country and the way that determinations are made and whether or not it fits into a particular box um, and that's because it's public funds generally. So there's learnings for us that come from the US and Canada and other areas where we've got minority um, groups within those countries where the funding of self-determination activities can be vital. We've tried it in the health space in this country, but generally the people making the assessment on those decisions around funding cannot understand that you're asking me in many ways for a blank check or for something with that lacks detail, and I've got to approve it in some way um, without the rigour that I would do for another assessment. So we had a conversation yesterday about we have these norms within this country that have been developed, and it's really hard to undo those, to the point where we will have people who will stand up and say, well, we can't do it because the Act doesn't allow me to do that. So until we get to the point where we understand legislation, understand reform around that, to embed self-determination, where a grant can be paid to an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group to determine their way forward in housing, um, that will be a happy day and we'll celebrate it within this country and we're not there yet. We're at a stage where we've got people talking about what self-determination is, but we haven't got the other side of the equation where people who hold the power and influence are willing to let go of norms that they've either worked within an environment or they're familiar with. That is the way that they do business and the way that they've done business for a long period of time. Until that changes, we're not out where the US is. But thank you for sharing that. No. Okay. Well, listen, I know we've come to the end. There's, um, I might just wrap up. We've spoken about some serious stuff. We've tried to be a little bit lighthearted. We've tried to share as much information and inform the audience of issues that you may walk away with a little bit more understanding that there's challenges in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing, and we can't 
um, create better outcomes by just Aboriginal people carrying the load all the time to improve the outcomes. What we're saying is we want to partner with people and that for people who are interested, work with us uh, and beside us. I'm just going to close on a positive thing. What's a positive message? Uh, and I might start with you, Lisa, and then I'll work my way down right um, for the audience to take home with them today. Aboriginal community controlled organisations own 39% of the Australian land mass. You can go and check it out. It's a paper by Kerry Arabino came out in 2020. What we can do is we can acknowledge what that means and acknowledge the strength of the Aboriginal voices in being able to determine how though, um, that land is utilised and uh, how that meets the needs of Aboriginal communities themselves. Because Aboriginal communities are very capable of being able to determine how it is that they meet their own needs. And with that, I just want to say, um, this is a book, it's available in the marketplace, it's about the Aboriginal voices that formed the Aboriginal Community Controlled Housing um, Provider, CARMS, down the south coast of New South Wales. So for those of you who need an in-depth uh, look at what that means and how, you know, after 20 years, the kinds of, um, of, of struggles they're still facing, please go buy the book, it's in the marketplace. Thank you. So um, for us in the NT, a, a positive is um, the partnerships, and I should mention uh, Peter McMillan with um, NT Shelter, Ahan Evan MOU with NT Shelter. You know, it's it's a one of a kind where we're working together. Um, Cheer NT, we work closely with them. We're we're working as a group and in collaboration, um, and and to understand that we've got a bigger bigger long journey ahead of us, and we, with our partners, we can do this. Great, thank you. Wonderful message. And Rob, the final word? Yeah. Um, I'll just end on that, um, like the energy in this conference and the conversations I'm having with people, and um, it's, just, it's just awesome. And so, you know, approaches, have chats, we're looking to work with people. We, we want to work to fix these things. We're not just pointing out issues. We want to work to fix, fix these things in, in partnership, like we said. So that's government, that's private industry, that's academia, that's everyone. Um, and that, that energy that I'm feeling now, let's just continue that. And I think we all can. Um, so, yeah, look forward to catching up. Right, thank you. And I'd just like to close by thanking you all for your questions and for sitting in. I also thank Uhuru for um, allowing us an opportunity to have a session with the, the full group. And um, we wish you the best for the rest of the conference. So, thank you. And thanks for the, uh, all right. Good work.